Kia and welcome back to our channel video drones. I'm Hannah Hart. And I'm Nick Hart. Nice to see you. Thank you for tuning in last week to see the Power of the Dog review. That was fun. Uh, in case you can't tell by the colour scheme we are blaring out to you, we are reviewing Parallel Mothers. By Pedro Almodovar. Almodovar, not Almodovar. As lots <laughs> as, of people tend to say. As lots of people say, we, we listened to him say his own name several times and we hope we've come a little bit closer mm. to how he actually says it. In fact, it doesn't say Pedro, it seems almost like a Pero. Pero oh, it yeah. almost skips the D. That's a lot harder for me to say. Pedro Almodovar. It's a beautiful name. It rolls off his tongue exquisitely, but we're just, we're just doing our best. Um, and so and after seeing the film a couple of weeks ago, it sort of blew my mind and I realised I haven't really seen many Almodovar movies. So we went on a bit of a deep dive this week. We watched several of his films. Mm. We um, started with Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, which was his big international hit. His first Just breakthrough into, one. yeah. And it, um, it's a very beautiful film and it features Rossi De Palma in one of her first performances with him, I think, maybe a second one, but um, and she plays a character who gets to have an orgasm in her sleep after <laughs> she gets um she gets uh she she drinks some gazpacho that's been spiked with tranquilizers mm, tranquila right. and she uh she falls asleep and she wasn't very happy about the lack of mm. Dialogue that her character had so when she <laughs> talked to Almodova about it They decided that she would have an orgasm in her sleep, which makes her character a little bit more memorable. It's mm -hmm. actually very cute So but we don't think she needs anything to be more memorable. We're a little bit obsessed with her I'm sad that I didn't know more about Rossi de Palma earlier. Mm. She's amazing such an icon Very charismatic incredible incredible actress. Yeah. I love her um, Then we watched Matador which I hadn't seen Mm. before and it features this very um, eye-opening sequence credit sequence at the start where the this teacher um, character of a teacher is furiously masturbating to these images from horror films really gory explicit yeah <laughs> he has a thing for uh, graphic violence this chap his first <laughs> fil early films the 80s films can be quite shocking I mean even even you know, stuff in the 90s and 2000s can be shocking in certain ways. Yeah, he well. never, he's never sh um, sort of leaned away from mm. being very provocative and, and really deep diving into topics that are, yeah, probably, and especially in, you know, European countries, quite taboo. Yeah, yeah. But as far as we're concerned, it's really important to discuss those kinds of things because they exist, you know. Mm. I think the... Um, the more you try to hide and shy away from these taboo subjects, the yeah. more problematic they become. So it's like when it hides in the shadows, it could sort of fester. So if you bring it to the light and you sort of just expose it for what it is, at least you can at least start a conversation. So Perversion yeah. seems to be a big theme mm. in his filmography. And mm. he was very influenced by John Waters and Warhol mm. <laughs> early on, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, John Waters is the king of perversion, but he does it in such a fun way. The Pope you know? of Filth. The Pope of Filth, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can really see, definitely see those um, John Waters influence, and more so in his earlier films. Hmm. Um, even Woman Under the Influence was a kind of a little bit silly at times, very melodramatic. Woman on the Verge. Like, Woman on the verge. What yeah. did I say? Woman on, on the, Under the Influence, which is a very <laughs> film, <laughs> which we're going to watch. Which so. we're going to watch. I love that film. <laughs> Woman on the Verge, woman, and it wasn't just one woman, there were several women mm, on the verge women. of nervous, women, uh, that were on the verge of nervous breakdowns. Yeah. Great film. And yeah, so Matador we watched, and we also watched Julieta, which is a more recent film. Mm, very oh, beautiful boy, drama. that's good. Um, with yeah. sort of a very gorgeous score by Alberto Iglesias, who we'll come back to as well. Yeah, Julieta or Julieta is, wow, just visually... Um, in terms of the score, the cinematography and the performances, I think that's where he's really, well as far as the films I've seen, I think he was really reaching like the height of mm. who he was, what he wanted to express, the way he did it. There's just a perf perfection about that film, it's it, exquisite. It's based on three short stories by Alice Munro, who's an author that I'm just getting into at the moment. He's, you know, he, he, he writes a lot of his own scripts, but um, he does from time to time adapt things, and his next film is a his first English language film, which I'm a bit scared about. Yeah, we're about. a bit worried about that. Kate Blanchett Ooh. is in it. Kate Blanchett is in it, and it's um, like adapting Alice Munro. This one is adapted from a um, 
a collection of short stories by Lucia Berlin, um, a, a Manual for a Cleaning Woman, which mm. I love. It's a great book. So I'm really, really excited about him doing it, but I'm just, yeah, I'm worried that there'll be something lost. Because he, he did make a short film um, recently, um, just before Parallel Mothers, um, with Tilda Swinton. I forgot the name of it. But yeah, that, that was good. It was, again, you know, beautiful, like all of his films. But it just... It was weird. It was quite jarring hearing people speaking in English. Yeah, I can't films. imagine. I'm, I wonder yeah. how that's going to go. Though his English is very, very good. Yeah. Um, and we also watched Talk to Her last night. Boy, which yeah. Was a more sort of absurd film. Um, you know, great screenplay. I think it even won an Academy Award for Best Screenplay. And it had some quite surreal sequences, like a, a black and white sequence with a man disappearing into a woman's vagina. Yeah, a very f fake looking one. Well, it was basically one of the characters goes to see this old silent film, you know, black and white silent film, which is really well done. Like, it's so period perfect. Mm. And the way the character's are behaving and the way it looks is so bang on. You can tell he loves Fritz Lang. He just loves cinema. Mm. And there's a sequence where, yeah, this is, this man drinks a potion and he begins to shrink. And he become, when he becomes very, very small, he decides to sort of, like, crawl over his lover's body and then just sort of vanish into this very cavernous looking, very fake vagina. But it's it's quite, it's, it's a curious little um, scene mm. and it actually incites this character to do something he really shouldn't. <laughs> and um, it's it's an interesting story, that one. It's about these comatose women. It's probably one of the films where like the men actually have more of a role than the women, which is unusual. The women mm. are sort of become comatose. They're still in every scene, but they, mm. they just don't say anything. They don't say, but there's moments where these dream sequences where mm. they do, but, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I do think that um, Almodovar picks some of his stories from headlines he's probably heard, newspaper headlines, stories like, you know, pregnant, a, woman, a comatose woman is pregnant and gives birth. I mm. think that that was one of the inspirations behind the story. So he's he spent an enormous amount of time on some of his scripts. It's hard, it's quite astounding to to remember that not only is he directing, but he's writing mm. so much of these scripts that he's working with, and then he sort of evolves them and adapts them to the actresses and the actors that get on board, and then he also does a lot of the editing, I believe, as well. I didn't know that. I think he apparently he does. I was just, I'm I mean, that's just. I can something. imagine him being very hands-on in the yeah. editing room. He may not do it all himself, but he's definitely very involved with it. But like David Lynch, he's yeah, very yeah. involved in the editing. As far as the the writing goes, with Parallel Mothers, that was, um, he actually has been writing that since 2008 or nine. because mm. in Broken Embraces from 2009, there's actually a poster for Parallel Mothers in the background. It's amazing, isn't yeah. it? That kind of foresight is... I barely live from day to day. It's like, oh, next week we've got to do something. But just the fact that he can plan this for years in advance. Mm. He must have other scripts on the go. He's yeah, yeah. a remarkable man. And he's so much energy. I just, <laughs> he's incredible. Oh, he had a small role. Was it in Matador? In Matador, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, he oh, used to be an actor. God. I mean, since the early 70s, um, he was a theatre actor. So he seems to have stopped he through the years. So he was good. amazing. He so. was so charismatic. I thought, why isn't this man acting? He's fantastic. He was, he was so charismatic, mm. so natural in front of the camera. It's quite sad, really, that we haven't seen more of him. I'm sure there are other little cameos here and there. I mean, he's a huge Hitchcock fan, so I'm sure he kind of sprinkles them throughout his films. Oh, yeah, that was that was a real real treat to see. Mm. Okay, so back to Parallel Mothers or Madres Paralelas. God, I'm saying that right. I'm gonna probably butcher so many Spanish terms. I I'm think sorry. You're doing very well. I'm, do I'm doing my best. I sort of I do everything at the last minute, having ADHD. So last night I was feverishly practicing some names and hoping some of them stick because I haven't slept. A lot, but alrighty, <laughs> here we go. So we have Penelope Cruz. Some people say it like that. I love that ending, Cruz. Uh, she's playing Janice or Janice after Janice Joplin. Who's uh, featured in the film. Yes, yeah, like, one of her songs is featured. A very sort of raunchy scene, which actually reminded me of um, Gaspar Noé's film Love. <laughs> Which oh. feet, feet, which was very gruelling. It's a good film. Such a gruelling film. Um, Gaspar Noé is like, oh, he's yeah. like, yeah. He's... If you if you want to spend two hours watching, you feel like you're watching the worst moments in a relationship. It's very taxing. Yeah, it's a um, taxing film. But there's lots of sort of you know sixties and early seventies music in it, set to some very sort of intense. Um, well, they're actual actual kind of porn like shots of people having sex he wanted to um combine you know a drama about relationships and porn so yeah so it's on it's what do they call it when it's like real sex on unsimulated unsimulated, unsimulated. Yeah, yeah. 
but it's not it's, the funny thing is it's not very sexy at all you're just mm. like Ugh. it's just i mean they're beautiful people and i'm surprised it's beautiful but just oh man the way he depicts sex i find really um repugnant sorry mm. guess for no way i really liked his film uh, climax though where a group of dancers take acid and it just gets so crazy that it was a really i love mm, that film it's my favorite oh so good and into the void has some incredible like uh, film work that he does just I don't even know how they did it it's it's very experimental and I, I suppose what we're talking about mm. Gaspar Noé is because they both are artists that are really provocative yeah I mean he deals with sex and perversion mm -hmm. in a different way mm, I, I, very different I, I, way I prefer Pedro's um, take on it really it's mm. there's something a bit almost cruel or something with cruel and, Gaspar Noé and, and more masculine Gaspar Noé mm. is more focused on the masculine experience Definitely. where um Almodovar is one of those rare directors that focuses on the female perspective. But back to the story. So we've got Penelope Cruz uh, as Janice, Janice, and her um, another mother that's giving birth at the same time. Her name is Melania Smith, and she plays Anna. And then we have Israel Ele Halde. Oh, that's a tricky one. He's Arturo. He is a forensic anthropologist that Penelope Cruz's character meets when she's doing a photo shoot of him. She's a photographer, a very mm. good one. And then we have Altana Sanchez Lijon. Whew. She is plays Teresa. And we have Rossi de Palma as Elena. Oh, quickly before I go on. So the Sanchez Lijon, Teresa's character, she was in The Machinist. Mm, that's right. Oh, whoa. She looks a bit different. I mean, that was like over 10 years ago. But yeah. yeah that was quite amazing. She's beautiful. She actually looks a lot like a drag queen called Trinity. So <laughs> she does though. Like Trinity's yeah, gorgeous. Show me a photo. I agree. Yeah, they look quite similar. And I actually did think that um, Melania Smith reminded me a lot of um, kind of a very young, but more kind of gaunt, perhaps not gaunt, but more um, more cheekbones than a Patricia Arquette. There was kind of a similarity yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, there was. Her eyes definitely. And her mouth and the way she speaks. Mm. She has this beautiful kind of melancholy about her that Patricia Arquette does very well. Mm. Um, so those are the main characters. So uh, so Yanis meets Arturo at this photo shoot and she says, well, you know, you're a, a forensic anthropologist. Can you exhume the graves of my great grandmother in several villages? Uh, so during the Spanish Civil War, which is just awful, over 114,000 people were killed um, or presumed dead and buried in these unmarked graves. And so, so many of these graves, no one knows where they are. But in this story, which is probably what really did happen sometimes, one of the villagers, he didn't die. He was very badly wounded, but he didn't die. And he managed to crawl out of the grave that he was... Um, placed in and it has his hand they all had their hands bound with a barbed wire which mm. was chilling Horrible. to hear really i mean if we go on and talk about it, this is um Alamova's most political film and it's mm. this what really got me um but she's saying you know so this villager came out and was able to say where these bodies have been buried as opposed to all these bodies that just sort of vanished into nowhere so that's how they sort of become they have the spark though, and of course that spark becomes a bit of a love affair. And the next thing you know, you've got white curtains billowing mm. out of a hotel room that can't contain their passion. And then you have this scene, and then boom, she's in a hospital ward, and she's about to give birth. And that's where she meets Anna. So they go on to have two daughters. So um, Yanis' daughter is called Cecilia, and um, Anna's daughter is Anita. And... Because it's um, an Aldamova story, even though this one is nowhere near as melodramatic, and don't worry, I love melodrama, it's nowhere near as melodramatic as his other films, you know that it's not going to be a simple story. So there are countless threads moving throughout this film. A very complex film. A very complex film, but very tidy. Hmm. I don't think it was ever sort of seeking for... It wasn't ever hard to follow. You just had to sort of follow the threads and let them go and let them come back. It's just masterfully written. I believe he... He, he's already won one Oscar for his screenwriting, and he, he should mm. really get. Actually, he's was, won a couple of Oscars. I think another one for directing All About My Mother. He, um, he and he's been audience. nominated for lots of Oscars as well, which is great. It's for, you know. Uh, it's actually, it was a shame because Spain didn't pick his film uh, f uh, for the Oscars this year uh, to be put forward. There was a Javier Bardem who we love, but it's a comedy, and he sort of was quite philosophical about. Well, of course they were going to choose that film because it's mm. quite political. And yeah, there's some tension that's still going on in Spain around those issues. So there's the, the basic sort of story. And 
boy, it is a, it is a good, good story. And um, I'll talk more about the ending towards the end of the review or when we rate it. Mm. Because, yeah, you know, that's the end of the film. So the end of our review. So on to the music where Nick is a bit of a mastermind with this kind the of music, stuff. music, um, Alberto Iglesias. Um, I think mm. it's one of the classic director-composer partnerships in cinema, along with the likes of Hitchcock and Herman mm. and Lynch and Badalamenti. De Palma and Donaggio, Cronenberg and Shaw, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, Alberto Iglesias has been nominated four times for an Academy Award, and this time is again, so I hope that he gets it, but it's a glorious score. Oh, his scores are so amazing. Uh, they, it's like this holy trinity of cinematography, music, direct art, oh, I suppose more of a trinity, because you've got all the acting as well, but mm. it all comes together so beautifully in this film. It often reminds me very strongly of Hitchcock, of Bernard Definitely. Herrmann. Yeah. It, it's it's definitely quite a it's like a thriller drama. It's there's a lot of emotional tension and a lot of just honest honest to god tension. We watched Batman and I was like the new Batman. I was like, where's the tension? I don't care. Meh. But this film, <laughs> yeah. this film, just about these simple characters. He's a huge fan of Hitchcock, so mm. he's, yeah, he's he sort of references him, him a lot. I mean, mm. we were just talking about that um, cameo and um, and. Matador. I think that yeah. there are probably a lot sprinkled through his films, um, cameos. Yeah. Uh, probably because of Hitchcock, you know. And the, 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 the fact that he manages to bring that element into his films is pretty remarkable. Mm. Uh, and it's genuinely a tense watch with these oh, just beautiful moments of sort of uh, release, I suppose is a good way to put it. Um, we, we also wanted to discuss the importance of watching international cinema, especially in its native tongue with the English subtitles. Here in New Zealand, we're geographically isolated and we're somewhat multicultural, but we don't have the same degree of um, international communities that we really, to be honest, I don't interact with many people at all, especially during a pandemic. It's the worst it's ever been here in New Zealand right now. We've got COVID everywhere. We've never had it so bad. So for the last few years, I haven't really gone out much because I have a compromised immune system. So, but even if I did, um, I've got Taiwanese friends and Korean friends, and I used to have some Latino friends when I used to go out and dance. But uh, yeah, we I don't have that much exposure to different cultures and different languages. So ever since we were both very young, because we love cinema, of course we love all cinema, so we've been watching foreign films for a mm. very long time. Yeah. And we think that that's been so important um, just for anybody in any part of the world, especially more geographically isolated places, it's a way to get an insight into a culture and a language and food and customs mm. and, and mannerisms that are just, I mean, I'm sorry, but the English speaking world, especially England, which founded New Zealand, it's quite grey, it's quite colourless. <laughs> if I walked around it's like quite this... It's a depressing place to visit, sorry. It is a bit. Is. It's a, Christchurch is a really conservative um, old-fashioned sort of a place. I would never kind of sadly dress like this really out and about. I, you get too much unwanted attention. We're all about wearing the black hair <laughs> and just sort of trying to blend in. Um, so it's been kind of an escapist um, way for us to enjoy it. And, and for the rest of the world that can't travel so much either, you get to sort of travel to these other places to be part of these other places mm. when you watch international cinema. And it's also a very a, a good habit, just getting into a habit of reading as well. Mm. You know, a lot of people get put off watching a film with subtitles, but I think it's a, a great idea. Well, my children, before they even started school, I would, <laughs> if they wanted to watch something, I'd say, right, okay, well, I've got some anime here for you. And there's no ads, I don't like advertising, I think it's dreadful for children's minds. So I used to plonk them down in front of, um, uh, what was it, sort of uh, sort of Naruto or something like that. And yep, they, they would hear Japanese and they would see the English subtitles. And that's really how they learnt to read. So mm. if little kids who haven't even learnt to read yet can learn how to read subtitles, I think anybody can. And if you do struggle to look at what's happening and read the subtitles, just watch the movie a couple of times. You know, there's, I mean, you're... You, you, always going to get more out of a film the second time around I think so yeah I just I just got to reinforce that um, in order to really expand your worldview so we don't have very good sound here so you can probably hear the people outside but um, it's a Friday night so, so. Oh, it's a Friday night people yeah. are having fun they're going out which is gonna stay in because of the COVID but um, yeah I, I just I just really encourage people to not not see the English dub and uh, watch it with the English subtitles instead so you can get to hear this beautiful language which 
it's in, in another reflection I had actually when listening to this film was how feminine Spanish sounds mm. to the sort of English speaking word world. We don't say the th sounds of Penelope Cruz. I mean, not everybody says it like that. She probably, maybe she even doesn't say it like <laughs> that. But there's certain words that um, have this th sound. And um, in New Zealand and a lot of English speaking countries, that th sound is just a lisp. We, we discourage people from sounding like that. Uh, I think. Unfortunately, a big part of that is this idea that the th sound is like gay sound. So this just so much ridiculous. Yes. The fear of the feminine is insane. So, uh, or that maybe gay people speak with a th sort of sound, this lisping sound. It's a very so old-fashioned It's a idea. very old-fashioned idea, but it still sticks around. So, into my ear, Spanish sounds so much more feminine, so much more gentle, so much more lyrical. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful thing to listen to. And I wish that we would incorporate more accents into this. Instead of like, you know, the Kiwi way of speaking is all like, we say milk instead of milk. You know, we're odd that we, we speak a little differently from most Kiwis, we've been told. I was, I spent some time in Bangkok as a child. I learned how to speak Thai. My mum didn't like me sounding like your average Kiwi, so she helped snap me out of that. So, yeah, neither mm. of us really tend to... Maybe it's all the international cinema we've watched. I think that's the thing for me, really. Yeah. yeah. We're quite aware of how awful, kind of, we sound <laughs> to other countries. We're ashamed. <laughs> We're a bit ashamed. ashamed. We're a bit ashamed of the whole Kiwi accent thing. Uh, it could be worse, but, yeah, it was, it's, I just wish that this multiculturalism would, would just really become more infused with... The world we live in mm. that would be uh, to our benefit i think immensely oh okay now we can have we rant about uh cinema um on film and on digital this is mm. one of the next areas yeah yeah um cinema for me is the magic you get from projecting the series of still pictures you film on 35 millimeter or whatever through a light bulb um, and this is an extremely mm. different process when shooting in digital which gives a very cold feel I mean, like just saying, we saw the Batman recently, and that was actually that was shot on digital, and that was a bit warmer. I think they're getting better at sort of making um, digitally shot films sort of warm, but it's it's just such a, a yeah cold sort of medium digital film. Mm, I think film on actual film stock has a lushness, a depth, and a richness, and yeah, a warmth. Mm. And it, it is a real shame that we are seem to be heading away from that. Uh, for maybe, financial for reasons. For financial right. reasons, but like having, you know, when we had intervals at movies. Yeah. And, and also, I can see why they do it, because, you you know, you get to um, shoot as many scenes as, as you want. Um, sort of, yeah, there's a number of reasons, but I just, I just prefer the look of film. Yeah, yeah. So that was the one thing that really sort of like didn't make it one of Nick's favourite mm. Almodovar's films, simply because it was shot on digital instead of film. Yeah, I just I love the look of the other ones. Mm. Um, Jose Luis Alcam, he's the cinematographer for this film, mm. um, and he's done quite a few of his films. He he actually did Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, which was the first one that he did with him, which you can kind of see a big step up, a leap really, in um, sort of the, the visual aesthetic. Um, and he did that, and then Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down, and then, I don't know why, but he kind of went off and did other films during the 90s and early 2000s, and then he returned um, for, I think, Broken Embraces, onwards and then he's sort of done like the last seven or eight films with him mm, it's a beautiful partnership mm. crikey and so yeah having said that about digital films he has done all of pedro's digitally shot films and they look beautiful i mean compared to a lot of other digitally shot films you see they're a lot more glorious mm. yeah they, they really work so so well mm. together uh, um, gosh, I guess we should just maybe discuss a little bit about Amadova's sort of general style, his influences. Mm. Yeah. Um, influences. He's he's very influenced by sort of forties and fifties films. Um, George Cukor, um, and like we were saying, um, Hitchcock as well. I mean, there's sort of suspense in all of Pedro's films. Mm. Um, he's 
very into foot slang, which we talked about. Um, he's, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. He's, he's a really great photographer as well, Pedro. Himself. That's right. He was said that if he, he could have any job in the world besides directing films, he would do a window dressing. Window dressing, yeah, yeah. which really kind of explains his gorgeous. Every single shot you see in every one of his films, even the early films, are so beautifully mm. set up. You can make yeah, an ashtray yeah. look beautiful. He does a lot of the photography that you see in the background in his films. Oh. For example, if you're in a kitchen in one of his films and you see like a there's I think in Power of Mothers there's a um, a framed photo of like a, a glass with a, a plant in it. He, he takes all those photos. Oh, yeah, they, they're find quite them online. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very, very multi talented. Absolutely iconic. Not just a gay icon, just an icon. In mm. fact, I only recently said to, to Nick, I said, is he, is he gay? And you're like, oh, of course. Very. He is. <laughs> I was like, oh, of course. He doesn't sense. like being considered a gay director, though. No, I, well, yeah. see, that's the thing. I wouldn't want to call him a gay icon. I just mm. think he's an icon exactly. or a gay director. He's just a, he's a director. He's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of does explain a little bit of the flamboyance. And maybe his ease with women, the way he treats women, the woman, way he sees women. Mm. He said that he was much more interested in the matriarchal than the patriarchal. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Actually, I think that's something I said, matriarchal and patriarchal. But he meant like um, ma ma uh, like ma ma um, motherly relationships rather than fatherly relationships. But yeah, that translates to matriarchy mm. instead of patriarchy. And there's too much of the patriarchy going on, you know. <laughs> there really is. We need some more equality. And he's one of those directors that, amongst many others, has helped sort of hopefully change some attitudes. Though he was saying in a 2019 interview that he's concerned that there's some nostalgia for these sort of fascist eras of the past and an erosion of the democratically won civil rights that they fought so mm. hard for. So I think he's concerned of that there is like maybe even though some things are progressing, other things are kind of regressing, mm. which is um, probably why he pushed for this new film to really explore these issues that he's clearly very um, concerned about. I mean, even the dialogue between Anna and uh, Janis, they're talking about sort of one side of Spanish, uh, um, sort of the right wing side of Spanish mm. um, government or people, they're saying that we need to forget the past and move on. And so, you know, there's this dialogue between the characters that's very, characters that's very similar. Whereas um, Penelope's more of the mind of like, no, we can't heal from the past uh, until we've, we've exhumed these graves and we've opened these wounds and we've let them heal instead of fester, which I totally agree with. And it, it is a real shame that there's still that debate going on and the, the, the government isn't um, sort of putting funds towards exhuming these graves and finding these bodies. But it's clearly something that... Um, uh, he's very, very, the director's very, very, um, very passionate about. Yeah. Um, going back to influences as well, I mean, we're, we're I'm, myself, I'm not really a, a big Tarantino fan, um, but something we got from watching all of Pedro's films is how influenced Tarantino has been mm. by Pedro. Yeah, um, or is he ever. You know, the elliptical storytelling is one thing, um, the crazy credits that you'll often get with Pedro and very sort of loud credits in Tarantino, those bright yellow credits. Mm -hmm. um, the so use of source music, lots of source music in both of their cases. And all, of course, all the pop culture references. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I love in Pedro's films, all the shots, for example, of books. I mean, I can't remember which film it was in, but there's a, sh a shot. Uh, Julieta. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all the books sort of spread out and... I'm always sort of pausing those scenes just to kind of, you know, learn what Pedro has been reading as well. Oh, that is a great way to find out new literature, new mm. music. And you, now these days, you've got this amazing thing called Shazam. So you can just, if you hear a song you really like, you can just push Shazam mm. and it tells you the song and pause the pause the film and see the covers yeah. of the book. So it's a really good way to find out about, or for the director to share their interests and for you to find out about these interests. Yeah. yeah. You, you get to learn... Um, for example, he's been reading Marguerite Duras and um, Clarice Lispector, who are two authors that I absolutely love. So, And films that he's been watching, like Phantom Thread by Paul Thomas Anderson, um, which is really cool. Yeah. So, uh, 
I suppose, should we talk about the ending of the film? Go for it. Yeah, okay, well, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but it's kind of the whole story. So it's not so much of a spoiler. But, um, so the film is, you know, it's very emotional, it's very engaging, it's very tense. And then there's this incredible scene right at the end where, like, all these villagers, mainly women, with these photographs, these amazing photographs of their of their dead deceased relatives uh, walking down this sort of rural road and they come to the site that's been exhumed where the bones of all of their family and, and villagers are, are lying and man that just mm. made just both of us very emotional me. like especially because yeah. at the moment with the war between Russia and Ukraine it's particularly we're feeling very raw about mm. that um, and sometimes it's very hard to justify getting dressed up and doing a, a review of a film or watching films when something like that's going on it's mm. hard to think well it seems so silly that I'm just sort of living my life and making food while this terrible thing is happening so yeah I think maybe it was extra because of that but also like I saw this in the, in the theatre as well um yeah so and it made us yeah we were both crying <laughs> I, I I even like sobbed a little bit which I mm. never do it, it's quite difficult to make me laugh and cry <laughs> but I was Pedro's yeah. films do that though Oh, it really just, just really just hit me about all these, these these bodies, uh, all these people, this entire generation in some places just completely wiped out. So many of them still lying, who knows where. Uh, similar things happened in Mexico as well, I believe, and it's just, yeah, I know a little bit more about that. But um, I, w I one of the books that I read a lot as a teenager was Homage to Catalonia, which. Um, George Orwell actually fought against the fascists because he was a very devout social democrat, which to this day still is, it's not even arguably, it is the best way of running any kind of a country or a government. Uh, so I'd learned a little bit about that. Uh, actually, uh, Jose Gonzalez, is, I've got one of his paintings up here, a uh, big fan of his work. He actually was raised in Catalonia, or he's there at the moment. So mm. every now and then we get to have a little chat, which is really exciting for me. So, yeah, that can, and oh, um, Jodorowsky is Spanish, isn't he? Mm. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I find the history of Spain and the, the creatives of Spain very, very, um, very, very important, very important um, voices. And I'm, I'm glad that I've been able to connect with so many different aspects. But yeah, right at the end, um, if it's not enough to see these bodies all sort of lying together, their hands bound with barbed wire, um, the final scene is like many members of the cast mm. and maybe even the filming crew are all yeah. lying in the grave. Their actual bodies lying like they're in the same positions as the as the bones. And yeah, that's just, I don't think anyone on this planet can be moved by how powerful mm. that was. It's going to make this right now, <laughs> Yeah, so it's a terrible, terrible um, history. Um, a chapter of Spain's history that hopefully will never repeat itself, but unfortunately in these uh, crazy times, some things seem to be repeating themselves. Hmm. So it's a strong anti-war message, I believe. It's a strong message to acknowledge the wounds of the past, to be honest and open and to talk about things that are maybe a taboo or difficult. A lot of this film was based around characters holding back the truth from other characters and how that influences them and affects them long term and it damages relationships so i think there's a lot about um honesty and communication and no matter how hard it is to say certain things you really need to say them hmm. and um was there anything else before no. we rate it no i was just gonna say should we rate it should we rate it well <laughs> i'm giving it five out of five hearts because i just i it's very rare that i'm that emotionally moved by a conclusion of a film and because I'm very uh, what's the word for it I hate being emotionally manipulated by a film I despise it that makes me really really angry but this wasn't that at all it was just simply presented as it mm. was and in that way it was so much more devastating so in terms of the effect the film had on me how it looked the performances was all so so good um, just everything about it and yeah that incredible and being a mother and you know the so story about mothers good bad and indifferent mothers absent mothers uh, it's a subject that I can certainly relate to and even though I don't definitely don't want to have more children it really made me miss having little babies because it's a pretty amazing time and so uh, yeah the, how honestly and accurately it was well they're, they're a little bit not sleep deprived enough to they don't cherry their hair out quite enough but I did think it was a very accurate depiction of motherhood from a woman in her 40s and a woman in her 20s 
she might have even been older than 40. So yeah, in mm. so many ways, I think as a woman, I thought it was an incredible film. It was very honest. It was very real. And that ending just totally destroyed me. So I'm t that's my like 100% five out of five hearts for that one. Well, I'm going to give it a four. Yay, um, we're going to give it a <laughs> so what's that nine out of ten nine out of yep. ten that's that's more like it and what what was the reasoning behind your well uh, yeah i mean i loved it very much pedro's i mean if i'm rating pedro's films um if, like usually if i'm giving them a number out of ten i'd give them all eight for example mm -hmm. they're all very sort of strong films yeah um, in different ways as well yeah 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 um yeah so yeah i just it's a it's a beautiful soundtrack and that's a, a big part of why I love this film. It's sort of it's quite a noirish soundtrack, which I love. So Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it was noirish without being dark, which is mm. and rainy is a difficult thing to pull off. Mm. So nine out of ten hearts for Parallel Mothers, Madres Palalelas. Please go see it if you can. Um, mm. Don't feel like you have to see it on the big screen if you've got COVID issues going on. It's still good. We've got a pretty big TV. So it's just, and I, I think it will stand up really well to multiple viewings. And watch the Academy Awards to see if it wins anything. It should. Better. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we could take over the Academy Awards. Mm. Can you imagine the films that would win? The ones that deserve it, I believe. Yeah. So, well, like and subscribe if you like it. God, that's weird saying that. I hate it when people say that. But yeah, if you want to, that would be cool. And we'll see you next week. See you later. Bye. See you.